Today, I wanna to share with you what I think are the most critical and fundamental parts of doing a devotional or quiet time. A devotional is a dedicated time where you've committed to spending time with God. Have you ever sat down and said to yourself, okay, I really need to do my Devo and spend some time with God, and then what do I do? What do I read? How long should this go on for? Is the ceiling just reflecting all of my prayers back at me? For those of you who might not be a Christian, or if you'd identify as recently having put your faith in Jesus, today's lesson is great because you'll be able to hear what habits Christians do in order to grow our relationship with God. And for those of you who've been Christians for some time, today is a great opportunity to strengthen your devotional habits and to encourage other students who find doing a devotional a consistent habit difficult. Let's dive in and see what are the key components of doing a devotional right now. Well, hey there, I'm Dominic and Lighthouse is a youth ministry at Austin Chinese Church where we desire for every student to personally experience the light of Christ and for students to shine the light of Christ into your spheres of influence. Welcome and thank you for joining us today. And if you're not currently subscribed to the Lighthouse channel, you know what you gotta do, subscribe. Last week, we talked about why regularly setting time aside to meet with God, also known as a devotional or a quiet time, is important for everyone. They really serve to set a foundation for your faith. You can attend worship service and you can come to Lighthouse and those are all good things. But just do the simple math. Regular time with God on your own is more consistent and over time will accumulate to far more than coming to church on a weekly basis. In short, we want you to know there is no substitute for regularly meeting with God. Today we're going to focus on what you can do, how you can do a Devo, where you should do your devotional, and when you ought to do your devotional. So let's get to it. Let's be clear here. There's nowhere in the Bible does it say every Christian must do these three things in order to have a proper devotional. So there's no official right way to do a devotional. So don't get hung up if what you do for a devotional is different than from what someone else does. But when we look through the Bible, we see that all three of these things are foundational to the Christian life. The first thing that's fundamental to doing a devotional is reading the Bible for yourself. 2 Timothy 3, 16 to 17 says, All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be equipped and complete for every good work. So this passage tells us reading the Bible guides and shapes our heads and our hearts, and that we live out the truths of the Bible with our hands and our feet when we interact with people. Additionally, Romans 12 verses 1 and 2 says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. In other words, as Christians, we are called to become more like Jesus than what the world says we ought to embrace. And when we find out what Jesus is like by reading the Bible, because the whole Bible is the love story of God preparing to send Jesus, foreshadowing that Jesus will deal with our sin problem. Jesus comes to earth, lives, dies, and rises from the grave to overcome our sin problem. Then we read about how we need to live and tell other people about Jesus before he returns again. As great as doing other things might be, we don't learn about Jesus' character without reading the Bible for ourselves. This is why reading the Bible is so important. Now, we'll get into some of the challenging parts of doing our devotional next week and in our fourth lesson. We talk about additional things we can do to add to our devotional and make it more vibrant. And in our fifth lesson, we'll talk about different ways in the Bible you can plan to do your devotional, but reading the Bible is the first step. I recommend reading your passage at least two times, usually three times. Well, why is that? 
Sometimes there are places or things that you may not be familiar with, or you found the flow of the passage a little confusing, or maybe you realize there's more depth to the passage than when you're done reading it for the first time. No matter the circumstance, it can be helpful to reread your passage again so you have a little bit of a better handle on it. So reading the Bible is the first thing you need to do. So what's the second thing? The second thing you need to do is to meditate on God's word. Another way to think about it is to allow God's word to sink into your heart and into your mind. Maybe when most people think about meditating, you think of this or this. This sort of meditation is more associated with Buddhist or Hindu meditation where the objective is to empty your mind because they believe that the mind is cluttered and distracted and that movement towards enlightenment means emptying your mind and separating yourself from the world. Have you ever tried to really focus on praying and you start off good? Then you start to wonder what's for lunch? Then you think about your favorite sushi place. Then you go, no, 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 uh, okay, I I'm supposed to be praying. Okay, God, yeah, uh, oh, huh, I have that math assignment that I haven't done yet. It's not totally unreasonable to see why Buddhist and Hindu meditation is about emptying your mind. You can see why there's an appeal to believe that emptying your mind is the answer because you're so distracted. What if you could just clear all those distracting thoughts out? Shouldn't that be the answer? But that's not the sort of meditation Christians have in mind. In fact, Christian meditation is the opposite of Eastern religions. Well, why is that? While we acknowledge that our minds can distract us and our sins can pull us in the wrong direction, we believe that we need to focus on God's word, on God's character, and for God to fill us up so we draw upon the life-giving nature of God like when Jesus says, that I am the true vine in John 15. Meditating is about being connected to God. Look at John 15, 5. Jesus says this, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me is connected in, in me, to me, and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. And all over the Psalms, the psalmist mentioned meditating on God's word. Here in Psalm 119, it says, I have stirred up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. And verse 15, I will meditate on your precepts and fix my eyes on your ways. See how Christian meditation is all about God's word? So take some time to focus on the key parts of the passage that stand out to you. It can be a really challenging part of the passage like Romans 12, again, when it says, do not be conformed to this world. That's such a huge challenge. So begin meditating on God's word and ask yourself questions like, what is the world value? What do I value? What are the values that my parents are teaching me to be important? Do the values that I hold consistent, are they consistent with God? And do the values my parents teach me, are those consistent with God's values and character? You're not yet trying to get to a place to do anything yet or to apply anything, but you're simply engaging God's word and reflecting on yourself and the sources of influence upon you to determine if you are actually being obedient to God in relation to your passage. It can also be the commitment or the action that a character takes that is challenging to themselves and asking yourself if you would do the same thing as a character you're reading about. In short, what you want to do with meditation is to take time to process what you read in the Bible. Don't just randomly open your Bible, pick the shortest section to the page that you've opened to, read the passage, shut your Bible, and check off your devotional. Recently, I've been making this miso marinated fish dish at home, and it's been absolutely delicious. So what you do is you take some miso, you take some mirin, and you take some sugar, and you mix it all up, and then you put the fish in it. Now, if you don't even take the time to meditate, it's like making the marinade and then just cooking the fish without even the fish touching the marinade at all. Now, if you take 30 seconds to meditate, that's like dropping the fish into the marinade and then taking it right out uh, and then just cooking it. Look, it's better than nothing, that's for sure. But that's not what's best. God's word, which is really like that marinade, you won't, it won't really be able to sink in and it won't 
really be able to make important changes in your life. Everything will just be on the surface. But what if you took as much time as you needed to consider God's word and ask questions? That's like letting the marinade work its magic overnight and then the fish is really tasty and delicious when you cook it. My encouragement to you is to take some time to let God's word marinate in your heart and your mind. Don't rush. Just ponder and think about God's word. The last key part of a devotional is prayer. Prayer is simply the time we spend to communicate with God. Yes, we acknowledge that God knows all things in eternity past to the present to eternity future, but God still desires for us to pray because it expresses our trust in God and gives the space for our relationship with God to grow and develop. In Matthew 21, 22, Jesus says, And whatever you ask in prayer, you will receive if you have faith. God wants our relationship with him to deepen. Also, God allows us to be involved in eternal in matters of eternal importance. So these are all wonderful and amazing ways prayer is important to us. Regardless of the content of our prayers, James 4 verse 2 tells us, You do not have because you do not ask. And above all else, God wants us to call upon him in prayer and he promises us to hear us like in 2 Chronicles 2, excuse me, 7 verse 14, which says, If my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Our prayers can be confessions of sin, praise and thanksgiving, adoration, and requests for ourselves and for others. What God desires most is that we communicate with him from the big things to the small things. He desires and he wants to hear it all from us and to be in constant communication with him. Now, if we were to put this all together in its most basic form, it might look something like this. You open in prayer for about a minute to let God know that you're in a state where you're ready to read God's word and you're ready to talk to him. Then you open up, let's say, to Ruth chapter one. You read Ruth chapter one and you realize there are some things that you don't know about, like what's Judah, what's Moab, and what's their relationship like. Then you read Ruth chapter one again to get a better feel for this Judah and Moab relationship. And then you wonder, what's the status of the women in these times? Then you begin to meditate and you wonder, why would Ruth be so loyal to Naomi? Naomi released Ruth, and yet Ruth is still loyal to Naomi. I wonder what motivated her to make that decision. And how could Ruth so easily say that Naomi's God will be her God? When I think about it, Ruth's loyalty and faithfulness to God seems to be the most praised here. After thinking through the passage, you spend some time in prayer thanking God for showing you Ruth chapter one, and that you desire that in all things in my life, God will be my God. Then I realize, oh, I have an English paper that I need to write and that, you know what? I'm not really looking forward to it. And then I praise that, praise God that our small group has noticed ways in which we've grown over the past six months and then close in prayer. Amen. And that's it. And that's 20 minutes right there. Just doing the basics. See, that's not so hard, is it? So that's my encouragement to you is to evaluate your devotional and to see what you can do to work these three key parts into your devotional. Now that we've taken you through the three basic steps of what to do and how to do them, where and when should you do your devotional? Like at Youth Retreat, It seems best when you have a defined time you do your devotional and at a particular place that's most helpful to you spending time with God and allowing you to give your full focus over to God. I definitely would not recommend that you do it at the end of the day when you're tired and you're laying in bed because you're almost certainly going to pass out with your Bible on your face. I'm sure you know that leaving your textbooks under your pillow doesn't allow for knowledge transfer through osmosis, and so same with the Bible on top of your face. So find a time when you have more energy and focus. And so for some of you, that may be the first thing in the morning. Others of you, that may be during lunch. 
And for others of you, maybe the right time is right when school is done for the day. You know your schedule best, so make sure you give yourself over to some quiet, focused time to do your Devo. Here are some discussion questions you can discuss with your small group today. First, is reading the Bible, meditation, and prayer a part of your devotional time right now? Would you be willing to add a part if it's not already a part of your current devotional routine? Second, why do you think meditation is difficult? What are some ways to help us spend more time considering what God's word has to say to us? Third, what do you tend to pray about during your devos? Are your prayers more inward or outward looking? Fourth, what can you do to ensure that you have the key components of a devotional and how much time do you think about that you might need to allocate towards your ideal devotional? I just want to remind everyone that Senior Banquet will be this Sunday at 6 p.m. Please make sure and check your email for the link. We'd love to see everyone there to celebrate our seniors. It's that time again where we want to show love and appreciation for your parents for Mother's and Father's Day. This year, we will be collecting photos that bring important memories to mind. The photos can consist of celebrations, food being shoveled into your mouths, funny faces, vacation photos, playing together, playing sports, or doing something active together. Whatever it is, it doesn't matter. All we need is you in the photo with your parent. Find one relatively current photo and another photo of your younger elementary-ish self with your parent and submit it to acc.church slash 21 Mother's Day for photos with your mom and acc.church slash 21 Father's Day for photos with your dad. Please submit your photos by April 30th on Friday. Can you imagine what your small group would have been like without a committed counselor like the one that you have right now? To be there for you every weekend, to show up when being on Zoom and Hangouts is exhausting, to invest in you, to pray for you, to point you to the gospel. Well, we're going to thank and celebrate our counselors on Sunday, May 6th at 1 p.m. over Zoom. We want to we want to do this through two primary ways. First, by sharing how they've shaped and influenced you over the past year, and second, by giving them a gift. You'll have a maximum of eight minutes to share with everyone how your counselor has been amazing over the past year. As a small group, you'll need to do a few things. First, make sure you have each other's email addresses so you can plan for counselor appreciation together. Second, Plan and prepare what you'd like to say to express your appreciation to your counselor. You can make a video, a presentation, something else, or just share in the moment. And third, you need to come up with a gift idea that would be meaningful for your counselor to receive from you as a small group. Now, remember, your counselor can buy anything you might purchase them but they can't buy something meaningful that only you as a small group can give to them. It doesn't have to be costly, though I'm sure they wouldn't be opposed to it. It just needs to be meaningful and personal. Now, if you have two counselors, you should prepare two gifts. Then decide who is going to do what and to buy what, and make sure everyone pays evenly. You still have a number of weeks to prepare. I'm excited to see everyone gather together to see and hear how you've been blessed by your counselor this year at Counselor Appreciation. Hey there again, I really hope taking you through some samples of what are the basic parts that need to be a part of any devotional encourages you to evaluate your own devos. Reading God's word, meditating on it, thinking about God's word, what it means, and what God's word might begin to ask of you. And then prayer are essential components to your regular quiet time with God. I hope you remember that scripture and prayer are two of our four core values and discipleship, which is becoming more like Jesus, is the third core value of four that we have. Now, these three core values form the foundation of core values at Lighthouse to show how critical they are, which is why we are doing this series in the first place. And I hope 
you see that it's actually not that difficult to get to a 20 minute Devo. And in our upcoming lessons, you'll see that it's actually not hard to spend time with God at all. Now, don't forget that your Devos are meant to help you grow in your love and your knowledge of God. Now, down in the comments below, share one key aspect of your devotional life that you know that you're going to need to work on more and the first step, the first thing that you're going to do to plan to address it, and you could win this book, A Visual Theology Guide to the Bible. It's a really great book, especially if you learn visually with charts and drawings more than you learn through words. We had a winner last week, and I can't wait to see who will be this week's winner. Make sure you stay connected with us online at acclighthouse.org and on Instagram at acclighthouse. Thank you so much for joining us and we'll see you in the next video.